but you're, I'm muted. It's on, but I'm muted. Okay. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. Um, Pastor Darlene is taking a few days off following her, um, not Pastor Darlene is taking a few days off following her ear surgery. So I'm filling in at, the, at this very sad time. Before we start worship, I want to speak to that. On Tuesday, I was working on today's worship service. The bulletin was mostly complete and I was working on my first draft of my message when I received an alert on my phone about the shootings in Uvalde, Texas. I was heart sick and angry. Another shooting, more children dead due to gun violence. I considered scrapping my whole service. Uh, something needed to be said, but what? I couldn't express my anger without using expletives that had no place in the pulpit, and I wasn't sure I had the words of comfort. On Wednesday, I received an email from the annual conference containing a letter from the bishop. After reading it, I said, thank you, bishop. I was planning to read the whole letter today to you, and it's quite long, and it would have been long, but fortunately, it was, has already been emailed to you, and uh, if you haven't read the whole letter, I encourage you to do so. I am going to read, however, parts of it today. The bishop always begins his letter with a scripture, James chapter 1, verses 21 through 22. Therefore, rid yourselves of sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. The bishop goes on to say, Dear friends and colleagues, when I, re, when, I re, uh, when I arrived in New York as resident bishop of two th in 2019, someone suggested that I highlight December 14th on my calendar. It is the date of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, where 20 children and six adults were shot and killed. Newtown is within the bounds of my Episcopal area. Over the years, I have attended Sandy Hook memorial services and listened to people who survived that horrific day. They will never forget. Life appears to have moved on, but their memories are frozen, paralyzed by an unthinkable act of violence on that day in 2012. Yesterday, it happened again. This time, it happened in Uvalde, Texas, at Robb Elementary School. Two teachers, 19 students, gone at the hands of yet another heavily armed person who gained access to the school and changed the narrative for families, friends, and the community for a lifetime. When will it end? The bishop goes on to cite uh, statistics on the rise of gun violence and how it is covered in the media and how, as a society, we react and then states, members of the House and Senate will debate the Second Amendment Guns, gun rights, basic freedoms established in the Constitution, and nothing will happen again. And yet, in Uvalde, Texas, there are inconsolable families. No words are good enough. In my role as a bishop and as president of the Council of Bishops, whenever events like this happen, the first question asked of me is whether or not I'm going to issue a statement. Words put together in response to another horrific act of injustice, violence, racism, or war in our midst. Words that include things like, our thoughts and prayers are with the victims. Today, I do not have a statement in me. My outrage and anger demand a statement, but my love of people demands action. I spent my life thinking about people. I am a person of prayer. But this cycle of violence has reached a point where, are there, where there are no good words and there are no words good enough. No statement that meets the need. No thought that will salve the wounds and heal the hurt. I believe that we must, with conviction, 
determine how we are going to move from words to action. We absolutely have done nothing different, and as a result, the cycle of violence and the denial of human life just continues. We are paralyzed into a position of inactivity that only allows the same story and the same response to happen over and over again. As a result, we live our lives on the defense, always re reacting to something that has already taken place. My statement today is quite simple. Let's go on the offense. If you are a lay person, determine today how, will you, how you will take the faith you nurture each week in a pew to the streets, the places where you work, and the homes where you live. Let's go on the offense today and play whatever role we can to change the cycle of violence and racism and other behaviors that treat people less than they were created to be and create a narrative that will compel people to live a life with a heart of peace. The call today is for every United Methodist Christian to go on the offense, stating that we believe the power of God can do in our midst, opening ourselves to the power of God at work within us, and doing whatever we can to alter the current course of behavior once and for all. The journey continues. Thomas J. Vickerson. Thank you, Bishop. Our prayers are with the families of the victims, and may your words spur us into your action. And now, before we start worship, I'd like to thank in advance Robert for, well, you'll see later. Now, come, it is time to worship. to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord, Lord you he servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Our first hymn is Blessed be the tie that binds, number 557 in the United Methodist Hymnal, all three verses. Verses one, two, three? Verses one, two, three. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Not all four verses. <laughs> Now 
now you can sit down. And please join me in uh, today's unison prayer. God, we bow our heads and hearts to you, God, that we may remember those who paid the ultimate price by giving their lives for their country. We can never be grateful enough for the sacrifices they made and we are humbled by the willingness of those who put their lives aside for the benefit of others. God, seal their sacrifices into our hearts so that we may never forget the loss of those heroes. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. The social creed of the United Methodist Church is a statement of faith reflecting our social values. Please join me in proclaiming. We believe in God, creator of the world, and in Jesus Christ, the redeemer of creation. We believe in the Holy Spirit, through whom we acknowledge God's gifts, and we repent of our sins in misusing these gifts to idolatrous ends. We affirm the natural world as God's handiwork and dedicate ourselves to its preservation, enhancement, and faithful use by humankind. We joyfully receive for ourselves and others the blessings of community, sexuality, marriage, and the family. We commit ourselves to the rights of men, women, children, youth, young adults, the aging, and people with disabilities to improvement of the quality of life and to the rights and dignities of all persons. We believe in the right and duty of persons to work for the glory of God and the good and selves and others and in the protection of their welfare in so doing in the rights to property as a trust from God, collective bargaining, the responsible consumption, and in elimination of economic and social distress. We dedicate ourselves to peace throughout the world, to the rule of justice and law among nations, and to individual freedom for all people of the world. We believe in the present and final triumph of God's word in human affairs and gladly accept our commission to manifest the life of the gospel in the world. Amen. We now will have grace jar. Uh, is there anyone that would like to come forward from the sanctuary or anyone on Zoom have a grace they would like to share? Great. Okay. <laughs> um, so we got to attend Neil's graduation uh, a couple days ago, which was wonderful. Um, he w did a two-year conservatory degree in uh, the performing arts. And I just have to tell you, the best thing about it was it was the most joyous graduation I have ever ever been to and I believe a lot of it was due to COVID because they had invited back the alumni who did not get a chance to walk for their graduation due to COVID and they were just so giddy and appreciative and they really really were enjoying the moment so it was really nice to see that celebration and my other grace is for the people who go out of their way in their lives to organize events um, in commemoration and honor of others. I attended a really beautiful candlelight vigil um, last night in Poughkeepsie that was organized by people. A rabbi spoke. Um, there were several politicians there too, but they didn't speak. They just stood there and, and bore witness. And it was just a really beautiful event. And I'm very grateful to the people that organized those things. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Oh, okay. I have. This is a, a thank you uh, that I could offer every week. 
uh, but I particularly noticed it just now when we were singing the hymn. You folks don't realize it, but if you looked in the hymnal and you, and you followed the music of the hymnal, you'd notice that three or four times during the hymnal, Heidi held an extra three beats because that's the version we actually know, <laughs> not the version that they printed in the hymnal. And so I reiterate my everlasting thanks to this lady who <laughs> plays the piano and sings so beautifully and helps us all uh, enjoy the music in this place. Amen to that. Today is our 29th wedding anniversary. Oh, yay, 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 yay. Um, I, we have a young at heart message, and I'm considering canceling it or not reading it. I, I did not write this. It was written by someone that I found online. Um, and it's about magnets and picking up brass things or not being able to pick up brass things and not, uh, picking up other metal things because brass is a genuine brass. Something is genuine brass. It will not... Uh, be picked up uh, by a magnet, and I'll just read the ending of uh, this uh, message written by uh, Lois Ed Edstrom. In the Bible, we find this written, let love be without hypocrisy. This means let love be genuine. Love that is real comes from God. We receive his love, and it becomes part of us. It is the real thing. When we study the life of Jesus and try to follow his example of love, we, come, we become filled with his love through and through. Then we are able to find ways of sharing that love with others. Genuine love, real love, allows us to cling to that which is good. And now the, our wonderful choir will sing Blades of Grass and Pure White Stones. And I always want to say snow. <laughs> <laughs> but it's stones. And I have to have my music a little higher today because I can't find my glasses. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Today's scriptures are from Romans and Matthew. Karen Van Valkenburg is on Zoom and she will read our first scripture. Thank you, Karen. Romans 12, nine through 16 B. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Thank you, Karen. Our second scripture is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Love your neighbors as yourself. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. These are powerful words from Jesus and the Apostle Paul. In the past few years, much has been written about bullying. It has become a prominent issue in the digital era. But bullying exists in many ways, and it is not a new phenomenon. I was bullied as a child with a nickname, Patty. You can imagine what rhymes with that. And I know how painful bullying can be. That is why I have been troubled by recent anti-LGBTQ plus actions taken by some le state legislature. Nearly 670 anti-LGBTQ bills have been filed since 2018, with nearly all of the country's 50 states having weighed at least one bill. Of those 670 bills, almost 150 of them have targeted trans people. Many have become law. Alabama passed legislation targeting transgender children despite doctors testifying to explain to them it was absurd. 45% of young LGBTQ people seriously consider attempting suicide in 2021, according to a survey published by the Trevor Project. It's the third consecutive year the rates of suicidal thoughts have increased among LGBTQ youth. Data indicate that 82% of transgender individuals have considered killing themselves, and 40% have attempted suicide, with suicide rates highest among transgender youth. And yet, some legislatures avidly and self-righteously continue to pass anti-LGBTQ plus laws. And I ask myself, is this loving your neighbor as yourself? Is this being devoted to one another in love? Is this honoring one another above yourselves? Many legislatures and school boards are enacting laws and policies that forbid the teaching of crit critical race theory in their public schools. Simply put, critical race theory states that US social institutions such as the criminal justice system, the education system, the labor market, housing markets, and healthcare systems are laced with racism embedded in laws, regulation, rules, and procedures that lead to different outcomes for people of color. Knowing how these institutions are affected by racism helps us to understand the lives of our black and brown neighbors. And yet legislatures and school boards want to ban teaching CRT. And I ask myself, is this loving your neighbor as yourself? Is this being devoted to one another in love? Is this honoring one another above yourselves? If you have seen the movie Black Hawk Down, this is the picture 
of the real Gary Gordon. Master Sergeant Gary I. Gordon, United States Army, was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, distinguishing himself by action above and beyond the call of duty on, December, on October 3, 1993, while serving as a sniper team leader in Mogadishu, Somalia. Gordon's sniper team provided cover from the site of the two downed helicopters while subjected to intense fire from enemy fighters. Gordon traveled the perimeter of the crash site protecting the downed crewmen. Having run out of ammunition, he recovered a rifle with only five rounds of ammunition and gave it to the pilot with the words, good luck. Then, armed with only his pistol, Gordon continued to fight until he was fatally wounded. His action saved the pilot's life. Master Sergeant Gordon's extraordinary heroism and devotion to duty were in keeping with the highest standards of military service and reflect great credit on him, his unit, and the United States Army. And I ask myself, is this loving your neighbor as yourself? Is this being devoted to one another in love? Is this honoring one another above yourselves? Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, Captain Riley Leroy Pitts, distinguished himself by exceptional heroism while serving as a company commander during the war in Vietnam. After his company landed in a designated area, it came under intense fire from several directions. Since his rifle firing provided ineffect proved ineffective against the enemy due to the dense jungle foliage, he picked up a grenade launcher and began pinpointing targets. He led his men towards the enemy position, Captain Pitts, displaying complete disregard for his life and personal safety, moved into a position which permitted him to place effective fire on the enemy until he was mortally wounded. Captain Pitts's gallantry, extraordinary heroism and fearlessness at the cost of his own life, above and beyond the call of duty, are in the highest tradition of the United States Army and reflect great credit, credit upon himself his unit, the armed forces of his country. And I ask myself, is this loving your neighbor as yourself? Is this being devoted to one another in love? Is this honoring one another above yourselves? The hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, was authored by an Anglican churchman named William Whiting, who was born in England in 1825. Whiting learned the true and terrifying power of waves when on a voyage, a storm blew in so violent that the crew lost control of the vessel. During these desperate hours, as the waves crashed over, and his, over the decks, Whiting's faith in God helped him to stay calm. One day, a young man confided to Whiting that he was about to sail on a journey to America, a voyage full of danger at that time. The boy was filled with fear at the thought of the ordeal to come. A sympathetic Whiting described his own frightening experience and prayed for the terrified boy. And then Whiting told him, before you depart, I will give you something to anchor your faith. Right, uh, Whiting, an experienced poet, put pen to paper, writing a poem reminding the boy of God's power even over the mighty oceans. It begins, Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm hath bound the restless wave, who bids the enemy, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. O oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. And I ask myself, is this loving your neighbor as yourself? Is this being devoted to one another in love? Is this honoring one another above yourselves? In 1861, Whiting's poem was set to music by the Reverend John Dykes. The hymn became enormously popular. British, French, and American sailors all adopted it. The Trinity Choir will now sing the Navy hymn.
My final tribute is to the four chaplains, four World War II chaplains who died rescuing civilian and military personnel as the American troop ship SS Dorchester sank on February 3rd, 1943. The Dorchester left New York on January 23rd en route to Greenland, carrying approximately 900 souls as part of a convoy of three ships. During the early morning hours of February 3rd, the vessel was torpedoed by a German U-boat off the coast of Newfoundland. The chaplains helped the others board lifeboats and gave up their own life jackets when the supply ran out. The chaplains joined arms, said prayers, and sang hymns as they went down with the ship. The impact of the chaplain's story was great with many more memorials and the coverage in the media. Each of the four chaplains was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and the Purple Heart. The chaplains were nominated for the Medal of Honor, but were found ineligible as they had not engaged in combat with the enemy. Instead, Congress created a medal for them with the same weight and importance as the Medal of Honor. The four chaplains were Methodist minister, the Reverend George L. Fox, Reformed Rabbi Alexander D. Good, Catholic priest, Father John P. Washington, 
and Reformed Church in America minister, the Reverend Clark V. Poling. I asked myself, is this loving your neighbor as yourself? Is this be being devoted to one another in love? Is this honoring one another above yourselves? My answer on this day of remembrance is yes. Amen. Please rise and join me in singing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for bringing us together this Memorial Day Sunday to acknowledge the debt. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. My, I just touched the wrong thing, and I will start this in a minute. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Almighty God, we thank you for bringing us together this Memorial Day Sunday to acknowledge the debt we owe to the men and women of the United States military who have guarded this country with their lives. We especially honor those who lost their lives while defending this nation. They fought on land and sea and in the air, always understanding that they may not come back from the mission and accepting that as part of the job. They were willing to risk death to protect the land we hold so dear and the American people along with it. We thank them for their sacrifice and promise we'll carry on their legacy to ensure they did not die in vain. God, we pray that you strengthen and protect all our military personnel who are serving presently and in the future. Give them the courage to face whatever comes, protect them in battle, and help them to prosper in times of peace. Watch over their families, God, as you watch over us all. We put your trust and faith in you, and even though we don't always understand your ways, we accept that you have a plan for each and every one of us. Please fill us, please help us fulfill our personal missions, whatever they may be. Now we will honor the veterans of our Trinity United Methodist family. Our own Stanley L. Brown, Jr., hospital corpsman, petty officer, second class, United States Navy and United States Marine Corps, 1952 to 1956, served in Japan and Okinawa, also stationed at the U.S. Army Hospital in Osaka, Japan. Robert's oldest brother, Charles R. Boisvert, seaman, United States Navy, Cold War era, 1957 to 1958. Karen Jenkins' father, George S. Kastner, Staff Sergeant, United States Army, World War II. 
our own Nicole Carino's grandfather, Richard T. Holtzler, Sergeant First Class, United States Army, Korean War era, 1948 to 1953. The 40 veterans buried in LaGrange Cemetery, especially Levi F. Williams, Union Army, died August 30th, 1863 at the age of 19. And his younger brother, James Williams, died March 9th, 1864 at age 17. This poem is on their grave. Come view this place as you pass, as you are now, so we were. As we are now, so you must be. So prepare for death and follow we. Heidi's father, Richard Sherman, ship's mechanic serving on the U.S. Wren, United States Navy, Korean War. Stan's brother, Bruce D. Brown, Master Chief Petty Officer, United States Navy, World War II, Korean and Vietnam Wars, 1943 to 1963, saw duty in a number of areas across the world, mainly on U.S. naval carriers. Marsha Grant's uncle, Norman Wilkins, Private First Class, United States Army, World War II, served in Africa, Sicily, and landed at Normandy. My father, Ralph W. Bill Burnell, Private First Class, United States Army, World War II, 1943 to 1945, landed at Anzio and fought his way to Rome, received a Purple Heart. Stan's father, Stanley L. Brown, Sr., United States Army, World War I, 1915 to 1918, served in France. Robert's cousin, Richard Bell, Major, United States Air Force, Vietnam era. Stella Brown's father, Gerald Pierce, United States Army, World War II, 1943 to 1945. Robert's next oldest brother, Morris N. Boisvert, Chief Warrant Officer, 5th grade, Vermont National Army Guard, World War, Cold War era, 1965 to 2005. Stella's brother, Stanley Pierce, United States Army, 1955 to 1958. My sister's husband, Daniel R. Hillard Sr., Lieutenant Colonel, United States Army, Vietnam War, served as a logistics officer in Tay Ninh Province, 1967 to 1969. Our own Carl Snyder's father, Andrew J. Snyder, Technical Five, United States Army, World War II, served in Europe from D-Day plus 10 to VE Day. Stan and Stella's son-in-law, Richard Flazinski, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Army, Bosnia and Afghanistan. Our own Robert Chira, Captain, United States Air Force, Vietnam era, stationed in Ent Air Force Base, Colorado Springs, and Shimya, Alaska from 1967 to 1971. Carl's uncle, Harold P. Snyder, Sergeant, United States Army, Pacific Theater, served until VJ Day. Karen Jenkins' uncle, Ronald Jones, Corporal, United States Army, Korean War. Carl's uncle, Jacob Smith, United States Army, World War I. Carl's other uncle, Philip Smith, United States Army, World War I. Craig Grant's father, Kenneth M. Grant, Chief Petty Officer, United States Army, I'm sorry, United States Navy, World War II era, 1942 to 1945. He worked in Washington, D.C. for the Naval Historians. Kim Collier's father, Charles Bud Thompson, Master Sergeant, United States Army, Cold War era in the 1950s. 
Steve Doyle's father, Philip Doyle, Sergeant, United States Marine Corps, World War II, died 1945 on Okinawa, received the Silver Star and two Purple Hearts. There are not enough words to express our appreciation for the sacrifice of these men. In their honor, let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciple to pray. O creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please remember that when you give to our church, you are giving to God. We will now receive your tithes and offerings. God, we return to you a portion of what we have. With joy and gratitude, we offer these gifts of service and support. Lead and guide us in the way, ways these gifts can touch the hearts and lives of your people in our neighborhoods and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. So, hopefully you got to see the scrolling announcement at the beginning of worship <laughs> and we now have the ones that are up here on the wall we have I have to get really close <laughs> because I forgot to print them yeah oh yeah you got you guys can sit down uh, whoops don't stand in front of them Patsy you can't see them okay for on June 12th we will have live music and uh Mark Dima will be down in Wikipedia. Uh, Mark Dima, I, I know him. He's a great composer and um, a wonderful singer. And uh, if you go, you'll really enjoy him. I know you will. There is going to be a bus trip to Lancaster, um, Pennsylvania in, I think, October. Yeah, October for Sight and Sound. It's about David. I looked it up. It looked like it was about David. Uh, there is going to be an all volunteer orientation uh, session for Love Inc. if you're interested. It's going to be on Zoom and that's that date. If you want any information, more information, you can, you can uh, reach out to me. And Karen's not here, but I think she's still con collecting sneakers. If you have any, you can still bring them. Uh, you can call Karen Riley for any information about that. I brought some very di dirty ones to her, so I hope she likes them. <laughs> and is that it? Is that the final one? Oh, no, we've got the food pantry. Bagging for the next one in June, because we just finished May's, is, uh, and somebody forgot to 
change the date no, for the no. dis June 28th and June 30th. Okay. But 30th of May 30th is probably not when we're doing a distribution. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> that would be June 30th. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't know if you need you want to get up. Everybody at this point, I hope, knows, but you're welcome to get up if you want to. No, the only thing is you said a little extra food. Yes. Come on downstairs and you'll see what we have. This year's New York annual conference is uh, late this year. It's usually the first weekend in June. It's uh, June 22nd to 26th. It's on Zoom. Um, the theme is uh, restoring, revival, resetting the, for the journey. If you want to see it, I'm not sure if some of it is, might be out on, on YouTube. Uh, the Bishop's Message sometimes uh, is, is usually on, maybe out on YouTube. I hope I'll have more in, information as we get closer to that date to share with you. And uh, is that it? Oh, okay. I, well, no, 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 don't get up yet. <laughs> yeah. Can I go? Unless you have something. I do. I just want to uh, tell everybody next Sunday is Pentecost. So we encourage you to wear red and orange and yellow to represent the holy flame. So please remember that. I will remind you throughout the week. And we also have a baptism next week. So we encourage as many people as possible to come and be in the sanctuary to help celebrate the baptism of that beautiful little girl. And um, we will not be celebrating communion next Sunday. We have de delayed that to the following Sunday. That's all I have. And, oh, okay. And, um, should we... uh, uh, Joyce, I know it's a pain, but they can't hear you on Zoom if you don't come up. And you got to stand in front of the microphone, or they're still not going to hear you. I'm, I'm being pushy. I'm sorry. <laughs> are we good? Good. I think now we're good. <laughs> um, we are still accepting applications for the Trinity Scholarship for the next couple of weeks. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you need any uh, questions answered or looking for an application. Thank you. And not to cut in on uh, Joyce's and our church's um, uh, scholarships. The, the conference also has scholarships. And if you go to nyac.com, you can find them. And so why not apply for more than one and see how much money you can get? So there are some out there. Uh, and I have one last announcement. I guess I will thank Robert again because I don't know about you, but I, I couldn't really look up because, first of all, I couldn't see it. And I had all I could do not to cry as it was. So um, that uh, presentation. I thought he, Robert worked so hard on it, and I thank him so much for it. And if any of you who, whose family uh, member we mentioned would like to have either the, the PowerPoint slide or have us print it off and send it to you, I am more than happy to do that. Um, so with that, uh, let us ri we can rise with a benediction. May the strength of God sustain us. May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the love go down, may the love of God go with us this day and forever. Amen. We will now sing our closing song. Thank you.